Thank you very much for joining us. My name's Verity Firth. I'm the Pro Vice-Chancellor of Social Justice and Inclusion here at UTS. And for today's uh, uh, event, we also have Joanne and Amanda here on stage with us, providing Auslan interpreting. It's a real pleasure to be coming together, both in person and online. We have over a thousand registrants for this event. So although there may not be a thousand people in the hall, we know there are many, many more online. It's really wonderful to be here uh, um, for National Reconciliation Week and this important discussion on First Nations justice and self-determination. I'd like to begin by welcoming Auntie Glendra Stubbs. She's UTS's elder in residence and she will do an official acknowledgement of country. I, I nearly danced with the, um, with the interpreter, <laughs> which is pretty cool. <laughs> um, wow. I reckon there's nearly a thousand people in the audience as well. It's pretty much a full house, which um, shows the importance of reconciliation in this country. I, um, yeah, so I guess I better do it properly instead of just rambling on. Michael, just tell me to like this if I talk too much. Um, so, um, Yalamandumara, Galindra, that's for you, Michael. I've been practicing. And for Lockie, where's Lockie? Oh, okay, so. Uh, so, um, so I'd like to acknowledge the land on which we, we meet, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and pay respects to elders past, present and emerging. When you're at UTS, you see many fabulous emerging elders both our non-Aboriginal elders, but our non-Aboriginal elders. And, you know, there's, um, you can't be at UTS very long unless you um, have the, um, the same values as our dear Andrew and Verity and the A-team that I call them, all the social justice warriors sitting in the front row and all the justice, social justice warriors that are sitting in every row after that. Diversity, inclusion, and um, acceptance is what UTS is about. And I'm honoured to be part of UTS. I haven't read one word that I wrote. That's just ridiculous, isn't it? Um, so reconciliation. A lot of black fellas go, Aboriginal people go, I've got nothing to reconcile. I mean, people that knew my sister Lola, she was very vocal about not having anything to reconcile. But, you know, I'm um, a softer version of her and I just think we just need to um, grab and embrace the hope of our young ones and hold hands and walk together on this journey because reconciliation is a journey. I remember the excitement of um, Katoomba when the Aboriginal flag was put up for the first time, the, and, you know, like someone said, Katoomba's a bit lefty. <laughs> I won't say who, but I think Verity just laughed. <laughs> um, and it is. It's, it really em embraces everybody's difference. And so that was a really exciting thing and the start of a, a movement. Um, it's been like a bittersweet week, week for me, you know, with Sorry Day and someone who was part of the... Um, the little committee that um, Kevin Rudd chose to to do this apology in Parliament, and that was a, a day that I never thought would happen in my lifetime. And you know, when I talk to the young ones, and I just feel the hope that they have, we are in good hands. UTS is in good hands, but this country is in good hands. The young ones are so fabulous. <laughs> um, so may you all be wrapped in auntie's love on reconciliation week and may you keep fighting the good fight and, and loving each other and, and the hope of, of us as Aboriginal people, no pressure, it's on your shoulders. <laughs> Thank you. 
For those who didn't hear that, Harry's having a girl, but we can talk more about that when we have the panel. So thank you very much, Auntie Glendra. Thank you for that acknowledgement of country. I'd also like to acknowledge we're on the land of the Gadigal people. I've lived on Gadigal land since the age of 12, and I'm now almost 50, so the vast majority of my life on Gadigal land. My children have been born on Gadigal land. My children have been educated on Gadigal land. I now work on Gadigal land, and I think it's with that deep connection to the country that I love that I want to particularly acknowledge the elders of Gadigal land, the traditional owners who bore the brunt of first contact, who bore the brunt of colonisation in so many ways and yet never ceded the land. They are the Gadigal people. Um, our university is built on their land um, and they are, of course, the traditional custodians of knowledge as well, so it's really apt that this university is built here. So wherever you are in Australia, you're on the lands and waters of Australia's Indigenous peoples. On this vast continent, hundreds of different groups and clans have their own culture, customs, language and laws. For our audience here today and for those online, we'd love for you to acknowledge which Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander country you are tuning in from. So to do this, you'll need to open up Slido and you can see the link for that on the slides and we'll share it in the chat for those of you joining online. All you need to do is click on the polls tab where you can let us know what First Nation lands you are joining from and where you live or work. For everyone in the room today, we know that we're all on Gadigal land so you can either acknowledge that or you can add the country that you've travelled from here today. Later this year, Australia will vote in the referendum on an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice. As a public institution, we feel UTS has a role to play in bringing people together for respectful and safe discussion and for opportunities to learn, underpinned by the university's fundamental commitment to First Nations people and their right to self-determination. We're delighted today to be joined by a distinguished panel of speakers who I'll, in I'll introduce you to later, but we're very excited to have them and to have the opportunity to learn more about the Uluru Statement from the Heart and its principles of voice, treaty and truth telling. UTS commits to the Uluru Statement of the Heart in full. So I'm looking forward to welcome, welcoming the panel up to the stage and telling you all about them. But I would like first to introduce UTS's Vice-Chancellor, Professor Andrew Parford, who's going to op offer some opening remarks and welcome. Thanks, Verity, and uh, thanks also, Auntie Glendra, for your uh, acknowledgement of uh, and your remarks, always uh, so welcome uh, as we start these important events. Um, let me also acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. It's on their lands on which the campus stands, the, the lands that have always been Gadigal lands and always will be, and pay respects to elders past and present. And just call out, as I always do on these occasions, the incredible work um, that our, uh, our Jambana Institute does in research and teaching and the difference that they make in lives, not only within the university and for our students, but also to the wider country in the work that they do across so many of the different disciplines that uh, the university works in. I'm sorry I've got a slightly croaky voice today. I assure you it's not COVID. It's off the back of um, uh, two weeks uh, on planes in uh, North America and South America talking to alumni and to partners at different universities. And it was remarkable that in many of the places that I went to, the effects of colonisation are still felt. Colonisation causing displacement, causing dislocation and death, and it being acknowledged, and it being acknowledged. And it reminded me so much of the conversation that we're having today uh, in Australia about acknowledging is one thing, but what does it mean to do next? Michael, um, my, my good colleague and friend Michael McDaniel, um, often reminds me that uh, although um, the, uh, the colonizer is the aggressor, the hand of friendship and generosity is often held out by our indigenous folk. And now would be a wonderful time for us to take that hand and work together to make a real difference and to make the change that's needed to be changed. The Uluru statement from the heart is so important. Truth, truth, being honest about the past 
and creating an understanding. <clears throat> Treaty. We've had many, many years of policies and the Closing the Gap report that has been released so many times tells us how inadequate they've been. So is it time now for a treaty to properly set the relationship between Indigenous Australians and other Australians? And the voice, the topic of the moment. It's not just about being heard, it's about being listened to. And that's the debate that we're having at the moment. In what form will that actually make a real difference? The role of universities in this debate is critical. We have the capacity to convene. We have the capacity to inform. We have the capacity to engage as we're doing here today, as we have people talking about the issues that we so desperately need to find solutions for. And at the start of Reconciliation Week, what a good time to envisage the future Australia that we all want to see. We hope that this, uh, this morning's event will bring some of those progress to the front of mind for people and that we will continue to engage as we move forward in the debate. So thank you, Angie. Thanks very much for that. Now, we're now going to move on to the panel discussion, and I'd like to remind everyone here in the audience, as well as those online, is that if you want to put forward questions for the panellists, you can. So all questions, again, will need to be submitted through Slido. Simply go to the link that's up here on the slides, go to the Q&A tab, which we will also be posting online for people virtually. The good thing about Slido is you can add your own question, but you can also upvote other people's questions that you want to hear answered. And we do ask, obviously, that you keep the questions relevant to the topics we're discussing here today. And I also say try to make them an actual question <laughs> with a question mark at the end rather than sometimes just a statement. Um, it's an honour to now welcome to today, today's speakers up to the stage. And what I'll do is I'll ask you, I'll ask each speaker to make their way up to the stage as I talk about you. So, um, and then take a seat wherever you'd like to sit. So, let's begin with Professor Robin Quiggan. Professor Robin Quiggan is UTS's Pro Vice Chancellor in Indigenous Leadership and Engagement. Robin is a Wiradjuri lawyer who has worked on legal and policy issues of relevance to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, including business, investment, financial services, consumer issues, human rights, governance, rights to culture, heritage and the arts. Welcome, Robin. Dr Tony McAvoy is a native title Treaties and Truth-Telling Specialist and a wordy man from central Queensland area. He is a barrister and Australia's first Indigenous senior counsel. Tony is currently co-senior counsel assisting the Yuruk Justice Commission in Victoria and was co-senior counsel assisting the Dondale Royal Commission in 2016-17. Tony is part of the Referendum Working Group, was Acting Northern Territory Treaty Commissioner and Acting Part-Time Commissioner of the New South Wales Land and Environment Court. Welcome, Tony. <laughs> Professor Lyndon Coombs is Industry Professor and Director at Jambada Institute for Indigenous Education and Research at UTS. Lyndon is a descendant of the Uluri people of Northwest New South Wales and has worked in Aboriginal affairs in a range of positions, including Director at PwC Indigenous Consulting, CEO of the National Congress of Australia's First Peoples and CEO of Tramby Aboriginal College in Glebe. Welcome, Lyndon. Dr Harry Hobbs is an experienced constitutional and human rights lawyer working at the forefront of academic research and legal and political debate about Indigenous state treaty making and constitutional recognition. Prior to joining UTS, Harry worked in the Parliamentary Joint Committee of Human Rights, the ACT Human Rights Commission, as well as the Legal Research Officer at the High Court of Australia. Welcome, Harry. And it's Harry who's, I'm expecting, his wife and his first child at any minute. So if he suddenly leaves the stage, that's the reason why. And I'll come over now to ask some questions of the panel. So 
So we're going to begin with you, Robin. Thank you. The purpose of today's event is to help increase our understanding of the Uluru Statement from the Heart, its principles and the implement, implement, implications, gosh, speak, implications of constitutional reform. To kick off the panel, what is the Uluru Statement from the Heart? Thank you, Verity. Um, it's so amazing to be here with my brothers and Verity here today. It's just very exciting and um, really uh, lovely to have a chance to talk to you all about this. I want to begin answering Verity's question by framing the way we need to talk about this. There's a lot of talk um, about this being a race issue and that this will create racial division. I want to begin by framing this. This is an issue about us as First Peoples. The status of peoples is recognised at international law, has been for a long time, and Indigenous peoples have been understood to have the status as First Peoples around the world. And I think, um, you know, the, our Vice-Chancellor just spoke about some of the battles, the battle of colonisation, the, the, the process of colonisation, that has meant that that's had to be something that international law has thought about. And in fact, it thought about it at the time it was occurring. And there were rules, there were international law rules around the process of colonisation. So European nations, uh, Britain as it was then, or the UK as it was then, was meant to follow particular rules as they set out uh, and colonise the world. It seems a strange thing to talk about now, but it, that is what it was. And what we know here is that those rules were not followed. We know that uh, for a lot of reasons. The Mabo decision attempted to wrangle with that and came to a sort of fairly pragmatic answer to that. But what we have here in this nation is peoples and first peoples where the status is not organised, settled or understood in any reasonable way. <clears throat> the Uluru Statement is the, the most recent version, really, of our, as a nation, of First Peoples and as a nation, us trying to come to terms with that unfinished business. And it comes, and I think there's a very good um, list of the uh, initiatives that were taken by Aboriginal people around the country, beginning shortly after um, uh, invasion in Tasmania. If you have a look at the uh, website, it's a really extensive, and I knew a fair bit about this, I thought. There's a whole lot of initiatives that I did not know about. We are cultural people, we are governance people. So when our place was invaded, when we were faced with overwhelming force, we began doing what any people will do, which is trying to negotiate and petition, and we began that from the beginning, from the very, very beginning. And in that website, you'll see multiple examples of the ways that we have done that over the years. The, the Yirrkala Bark petition, the Barunga Statement most recently, the uh, initiatives in relation to constitutional recognition, the many joint parliamentary inquiries. We've had a, there's a lot that's gone on that has, uh, has gone on trying to answer that question, find a way to answer that question. And the Uluru Statement is the most recent of those. I'm just going to, um, I will stop talking in a minute, Verity. <laughs> go, go for it. <laughs> I'm gonna just read you. Lots of you will have seen the Uluru Statement, but I'm just gonna read you, um, the, thing, the part that is most relevant, I think, there's a lot in it, but this is, this is the piece that I think we're talking about today. We seek constitutional reforms to empower our people and take a rightful place in our own country. When we have power over our destiny, our children will flourish. They will walk in two worlds and their culture will be a gift to their country. We call for the establishment of a First Nations voice enshrined in the Constitution. Makarata is the culmination of our agenda, the coming together after a struggle. It captures our aspirations for a fair and truthful relationship with the people of Australia and a better future for our children based on justice and self-determination. We see a Makarata commission to we seek a Makarata com commission to supervise a process of agreement making between governments and First Nations and truth-telling about our history. 
So that's part of, of that statement. And as I say, um, I think about... Um, Arne Glendra was talking about, you know, the local council raising the flag. We have, over generations and generations, in our capacity as First Peoples, been negotiating with local council, with state governments, with early day colonisers, with federal governments, going to using the international human rights system. Because we are cultural people, we are governance people, and so we use those mechanisms to try and come to a place of um, where this country, this nation state and us can recognise each other as, as distinct peoples in this place. So this is the most recent version of that ongoing um, activity on our part. And I'll say one last thing about that. So it is not just us that need this to be, um, to need a, to, who need a remedy or a way forward with this. It's the nation state that did not take this country according to the rules of the time. So we need a way to find, to come to peace, to make a peace with that. Not all of us think this is the, you know, the ultimate answer, but it is the peace on the table at the moment and we do need to learn more about it and we do need to talk to each other about it. And there is an urgency about it now. Thanks. Thanks, Robin. So I'm going to ask a question now to all of you, and we might um, start with you, Lyndon. What does Indigenous sovereignty and self-determination mean? What does it mean to you? Um, it means um, us acting in a way that uh, is culturally appropriate. It means doing the things that we want to do. Um, for me, I always try to think about it in practical terms of what does that mean? look like um, and I think we're going to go through some of that um, through this process which is how do we um, talk to each other, how do we relate to each other, how do we negotiate between nations, how do we set up um, systems of government and the way in which we want to live really um, and not be looking to the government for um, permission or anything like that. So that's what it means to me. It's a long road to go, but yeah, yeah. that. Tony? Um, thank you, Verity. Um, oh, hi, everybody. Uh, I acknowledge, too, that we're on Gadigal mm -hmm. country. Um, I acknowledge my people back at home in central mm -hmm. Queensland as well. Um, indigenous sovereignty is a, is a, a vexed issue in uh, Australia at the moment. We have many people suggesting that the uh, voice to parliament will interfere with in, uh, indigenous sovereignty but uh, my experience in treaty work and in native title work tells me that that my people the Wiri speaking people of Wangan and Yagalingu country we're the only people that can speak for our country i am only obliged under law to my people. If I've stepped wrong, I'm accountable to my elders. Anybody wants to speak about my country, they have to come to us. That's what our sovereignty means. And everybody I've worked with around the country in every state and territory except Tasmania says the same thing. You've got to come through us. We're the, we're the bosses here. That's how our, uh, First Peoples express sovereignty. Mm. And you can see that that expression of sovereignty comes into a direct conflict with the sovereignty that's asserted by the British, which Robbins uh, properly said is a flawed assertion of sovereignty. How then do we deal with this ongoing and proper assertion of continuing Indigenous sovereignty in the face of an overwhelming force that, that says, we now make the rules here. How do we do that? We can um, approach it from a very principled position, but in the end, there's going to have to be some adjustment on our part and on the government's part to accommodate both systems. Uh, one way in which that's done, which uh, I often talk about and I'll just briefly uh, draw your attention to is is through changing the legal system 
and I, I'm, I've been watching closely the work that's being done in New Zealand at, at Tauraroa, where they have a, a, a process of indigenisation of their law degree, where they teach young lawyers and propose to teach the profession how to understand Maori law, how the two f and, and how the two fit together. And their equivalent of the Australian Law Reform Commission, the, the Law Commission, is doing a study right now on how those law systems can fit together in what they say is a bi-dural system. Now, we're a long way from that, but that's what recognition and, and observance and respect for Indigenous sovereignty means. It means understanding we've got law systems of our own. We operate according to our ancient law and there needs to be an accommodation in this country of our sovereignty if the country is to, to live and act and, and uh, go forward in a respectful manner. Um, and, you know, a lot of people see that as, as the Australian nation having to give something away. I say, you should be grateful. We're giving something to you. We're inviting you to see the world through a, a, a lens that is very deeply connected to the country and something that you, you to date, have, have uh, really not grasped. So um, that's how I, I see uh, Indigenous sovereignty um, and um, we'll have some discussion about how we might be able to deal with that in the Constitution later, I suspect. That's correct. So Harry, Indigenous sovereignty and self-determination. Yeah, I think they were really great answers, uh, all, all of them. <clears throat> uh, I'm, I'm a non-Indigenous Australian, and so a lot of the way that I think about this is guided by listening to people, obviously, and listening and reading and, and, and having conversations with people who are experts in this. I think the, if I can just pull out two things that are, I think are connected between the answers, the first one is that uh, Indigenous sovereignty, it's a starting point for discussion and engagement, right? It, it's sort of saying that this is two, two authorities as such that might claim um, some, some ground, or some land, essentially. Uh, one is based on 65,000 years of continuing connection and, uh, and, uh, and, and governance and, and that complex system that has developed to, to live on this country for so long and care for this country. And the other one is based on uh, an invasion in just over 200 years ago, which, as Robin was saying, was set up, you know, under illegally under the rules that the British themselves developed. So they didn't even follow their own legal system, right? But uh, the, the starting point then is engagement, and it's about dialogue and discussion. And so it shouldn't seem to be scary, but a lot of people, a lot of non-Indigenous Australians think of it as scary. And, and we see things like people saying sovereignty never ceded, and, and some non-Indigenous non -Indigenous Australians think, well, what does that mean? How does that relate to what I'm dealing with in my life right now? But I really do think it's just, it's an invitation for dialogue and discussion. And again, that is what The Voice is about. It's about trying to start conversations, start discussions. The other key thing I would say is that um, we're, very, we're very familiar in Australia with uh, forms of divided sovereignty. Uh, we live, well, we're right here now at UTS, which is governed by uh, rules set out, by uh, UTS Council sets out rules. Uh, New South Wales government passes rules for this place, and so does the Australian government. So there are three forms of authority that are just on the settler state side right now. This is not a complex or difficult thing to work out, right? We are, we are a federation. We're used to divided forms of sovereignty and authority. So I don't see why Indigenous sovereignty is challenging for us on that basis. It's, it's, it's another layer. It's another conversation and discussion point about how to engage in this country. Thanks. Yeah, that's really well put. Robin? I don't know that I need to add much more. I think um, there's been a really well... Um, I, I really... All the answers, the uh, way other people have responded really, really resonates. For me, I think the one thing I might say is that uh, on self-determination, uh, it is, is recognised as a human right and it is recognised as a right of First Peoples. And in the last century... <laughs> We had, or maybe it was, I don't know, in the days of ATSIC, now you, the um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission, what you'll hear about ATSIC, because it, it, it was a department, a government department, essentially. You'll hear also, you'll hear the line, ATSIC was a failure. I was terrible. Can't go back to the days of ATSIC. And like any of our, um, you know, government departments that we might complain a bit about or go, you know, they're not solving things or they didn't give me, you know, that grant that I applied for, whatever. 
It wasn't perfect, but it was an amazing example of us being self-determining and setting the course for um, within the government framework. So nothing is purely you know, self-determining when we operate in that framework. But we were able to be really self-determining, but largest in uh, the Jambana Research Institute is doing a big uh, history project on the, the history of ATSIC. And Pat Turner was saying was the biggest, largest employer of Aboriginal people, really active in international human rights. All our reparations work, except where it started in small in collecting institutions, the reparation of our, our human remains, absolutely driven by ATSIC housing, business, all these amazing programs that was an expression within the, within the framework, within the bureaucracy of us being self-determining. Nothing's perfect, nothing's without, you know, without valid criticism. As, as I said, you know, no government department or no program is without you know, its critics and that's part of a, of, a, of a vibrant democracy that we critique things. But don't believe this rhetoric that, that the one example of our self-determination in the form of ATSIC was a failure. Not perfect, but there are many fabulous lessons. You know, like I think this generation sitting here, certainly um, uh, Linda and Tony and myself, we grew up really supported by the fact that there was this amazing institution. I worked for the Human Rights Commission. We worked really closely with ATSIC. We were, it was an amazing place. It grew a lot of our First Nations lawyers, leaders, and, um, and if you didn't work for them, you worked with them. So I just want to say that, you know, this myth that ATSIC was, uh, was a failure, don't buy that. You know, we have been here before. We have established something previously. As I say, not perfect, but it did a lot of good things that since it, it was dismantled have been whittled away, um, foster, you know, um, a lot of those initiatives were sent out to government departments where people didn't know what they were doing and we lost a lot of ground with the loss of it. Again, not perfect, but don't believe it was a complete failure. Thanks. So, Tony, you're on the referendum working group. So I'm wanting to come to you to talk to you about the Indigenous Voice to Parliament and what it seeks to achieve. Yes, thank you. Uh, it's um, an interesting question. Uh, I think about the voice to parliament at really three levels. There's the, the mechanical aspect of it. It's, it's the creation of a body that can make representations to parliament and the executive government. So what that means, if there's, if there's a bill that's tabled in relation to superannuation, that body might be able to say, well, if you're going to amend the superannuation legislation, you should, you should lower the age of uh, access to pension for Aboriginal people to, to 65 or to 55, taking into account what we know about our, our, um, our mortality rates and our life expectancy. Because, uh, you know, Linda, I know Linda has been ca was campaigning on this for a long time, but, but for those of you that don't know, you know, most of our um, people don't get to retire. They work until they die because we don't live long enough to reach the retirement age. So, you know, that's a really important thing. Um, but there might be, a, 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 alternatively, an application to the Minister for Indigenous Affairs over uh, seeking a protection of a site under Section 10 of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Heritage Protection Act. And so the voice could make a representation to, to that minister. And that would be minister exercising their role as the, in the executive government under that legislation to determine whether that site ought to be protected. And in the main, it's going to be those sorts of representations that will be made. And, and what will happen is depending on the, on the strength of the credibility of the voice, so the, the, on how much value the community places on the voice and, and its, its social licence, I suppose, those submissions, those representations may be very powerful, very effective, and, and it may be that a government may not want to cross the voice on a particular issue. Or if, it's, if the voice is not able to manage its credibility, it may have very low value and may be dis disregarded. 
And that's, that's the risk that we all take in this. We, there's no guarantees. I mean, you know, when they, when they included in the, in the constitution that you, um, that you couldn't be a, a dual citizen, they didn't know that section 44 was going to strike out all of these parliamentarians who, who held, held dual citizenship. So, so it's that mechanical process, and and what what is proposed um, is that, uh, and I encourage you all to have a look at the voice design principles. If you just search Google voice design principles, you will see them. Those principles have been approved by the the federal cabinet. They've been referred to in the attorney general's second reading speech for the constitution alteration bill, the voice bill. And what that means is that a, a, the court, the High Court, can have regard to those materials as, as extrinsic materials in terms of, of uh, interpreting the legislation that is brought into existence to create the voice. So it's, it's, fairly, uh, it's a fairly strong uh, requirement that, uh, that is included in the voice design principles that the representatives be selected by Aboriginal people and they be, that they be selected by local communities and that, they, that the representatives be Aboriginal people. So you'll hear a lot of, a lot of people saying, oh, well, it could be they, they can just appoint themselves. Tony, Tony Abbott can be the special envoy to blackfellas and, and, uh, or, or it could be Jacinta Price expressing her views and, and that, that would satisfy the representative nature of it. Well, if you look at the voice design principles, the only way that... Senator Price would get appointed is if she were put there by Walpri people or the mob at Yuen Demu. Um, and, you know, you can make your own assessment about whether, what the likelihood of that happening is. So um, there's that mechanical process. Then there's a, then there's a parliamentary structural uh, element of it. We're, we're adding a, 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 another element to the parliamentary structure. It's not a third chamber, but it's a, it's a part of the process that needs to be built in. So the, the legislation might provide that the voice has uh, two weeks to respond to a bill once tabled and first read in the parliament. Or, uh, or there might be special provisions for urgent matters where there's a, there's a requirement to respond within 24 hours or, or 72 hours. And there might be special provisions about how notices to be given in respect of certain matters. So matters that affect um, the rights of Indigenous peoples, matters in which the Racial Discrimination Act is, is likely to be suspended, matters in which um, there are uh, impacts on, on uh, Indigenous uh, land or waters or, or sites might require uh, have a mandatory requirement. Other matters, such as the Superannuation Act, which are indirect, May not have a uh, may, may be something that we have the capacity to make representations with respect to, but but um, government might not be required to to consult with us over those things. In general, that's how it's going to work. It's not a veto of parliament, though. But the but the parliamentary process and the uh, and the executive government processes need to find a space for the voice to make it work. And, and I have every confidence that can be done. Um, no, none of the, uh, well, sorry, most of the legal experts that gave uh, evidence in the Joint Select Committee hearings uh, just recently didn't see any problems with how it was going to work. Uh, 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 it can be done. The third aspect of the voice is a, is a much bigger structural change. It's, it's the first step in a, a change for this country whereby we find some harmonious accommodation of Indigenous nations. And I say this to people not, as, not by way of threat, but we, uh, we are here and we are not going away. The, the Irish uh, maintained their resistance against the British for over 800 years. In Chile, the Mapuche people have been in armed conflict with the Chilean government for decades. What we're trying to, what, what the, the authors of the, of the uh, Uluru Statement and, and now those of us who are saying, look, 
this, is, this voice is something that we've got to take, take forward. We're saying, well, this is the first step towards some fairer, more equitable arrangement where we as First Peoples, First Nations, can have a say about our own existence without, accepting, without upsetting the whole apple cart. And, and this, as I say, this is the first step. There's, there's got to be a truth-telling process and there's got to be treaties, but it, we are at a, at a structural level, at a broad structural level, we're, we're offering a, an olive branch. We're saying, we don't, want to, we don't want to keep fighting with you and seeing our kids locked up and seeing our, our, our people die in jail. We want to find a better way and, and this is the olive branch. This is, this is the first part. And so uh, they're, they're the various ways I see it. Thank you. Thank you for that. That was really, really useful. Yeah. So, Harry, I'm going to come to you because when we were planning this event today, we, we know that there are some people out there with really high levels of knowledge about constitutional process and referendums and colonial law and all of colonisation law and all of that sort of thing. And there are others that really don't know a lot. And so we're not going to assume there's this very high level of knowledge, particularly around constitutional law. Doesn't, doesn't stop them from speaking about it, though, Verity, I, I should add. <laughs> so true. Um, but Harry does know a bit about constitutional law, so I am going to ask him. So can you give us a bit of an explainer on the role of the Constitution and how our laws are made, why it's important that this is enshrined in the Constitution, and the role of a referendum in altering the Constitution? Why are we going down this path? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And I, I, I mean, I agree with you, Verity. I don't want to speak out of school. I see that my former dean uh, here, Leslie, uh, but uh, I've been teaching in Introduction to Law, Foundations of Law this semester, and, and when the students arrive, they, they don't know much about the Constitution. Uh, if, they, if I ask them much about it, they'll say, oh, I know that I can plead the Fifth Amendment if the police uh, come talk to me. And they say, SVU told me I can do this. And, uh, and, and you know, unfortunately, that's, we don't have that, right? Uh, and most of our knowledge about the Constitution is picked up from popular media, which is generally American. When I ask them to look at the Constitution and tell me what's in it, they're surprised that we don't have a Bill of Rights. Uh, I always enjoy te pointing them to Section 3 of the Constitution. Uh, you know, it's right at the top. You know, I think one is a really important provision. Uh, if anyone knows it off the top of their head, it's the salary of the Governor-General. Uh, it's set out really early. We want to get that right up the top, right? It's very important we reach agreement on that. It, it was obviously drafted at a particular time, right? The 1890s. It was drafted by uh, colonial-era politicians. Uh, no women, no Indigenous peoples were involved. Uh, uh, just uh, white colonial-era politicians. And it reflected their aspirations and their views of what they thought was, uh, would, would be important in a country. Um, it's important today because it's the preeminent law of the country. It's the founding document. All law in Australia must be consistent with the Constitution. All law in Australia must be consistent with what a group of colonial era politicians thought was important in the 1890s. Uh, that's why it's important today. Uh, as, you suggest, as you might suggest, you know, it, it doesn't include any recognition of Indigenous laws. It doesn't actually at the moment even mention Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. They're not mentioned in the Constitution. So that's the document we have. Uh, and we can get around, you know, we can work with it. It makes sense still today in many respects, right? We, uh, we have a thriving society and, and, and everything seems to work pretty well. And I think it's quite good that we don't live in a, in a country or a society where we need to keep pointing to our constitution uh, to get through the day. You know, it's good that we have a low knowledge, but it comes harder when we need to change it. Because they also set up a particular procedure to change the constitution if you want to amend it, right? Ordinarily, parliament can amend any law it likes. That's what parliamentary supremacy says. Uh, but to amend the constitution, you've got to go through a particular procedure uh, and you need uh, what's called a referendum. So you need to get a majority of people in, across the country voting. So 50% plus one of the nation needs to vote in favour. And you need to get a majority of states as well, which is four out of six states. If we had seven states, it would still be four states, right? But with six with an even number, it's a bit harder. That means if three states vote no, it doesn't matter if 70% of Australians vote yes. It's not passing. They did it this way because Again, they were colonial era, colonial era politicians, and one of the things they were really worried about was making sure that Tasmania and South Australia and Western Australia were protected. And they, they couldn't, they, the bargain that they had struck couldn't be changed. But again, Aboriginal people weren't part of that bargain. So their interests were never reflected in the Constitution, and they're still not today. So the Constitution is important because all law flows from it. And if something, if the Parliament in Canberra or New South Wales does something that's inconsistent with the Constitution, the High Court overrules it, overturns it. But you have a document that's never, well, hasn't been changed uh, much since 1901, only changed eight times. The last time in 1977, uh, it you know, runs out of steam a little bit, right? And, and things need to be fixed up. 
And so the voice needs to be put in the Constitution, in my view, because, number one, it will give it the institutional presence that Tony talks about. It allows it, gives that, gives that opportunity to be able to speak uh, and, and have that um, significance there. It also uh, fixes up or rectifies that glaring omission uh, that Aboriginal people weren't involved in the Constitution in 1901, and they live in a country that they have never had uh, given their assent to, essentially. They weren't involved in any of these debates. Uh, and, but most importantly, I think, for the practical sense of why the voice needs to be in the Constitution, as Tony says, the voice has no legal mandate. There's no legal obligation on government or parliament to listen to the voice or engage with the voice or respond to the voice, let alone uh, do what the voice says. The voice will only work if it has political and moral strength. And the only way it will get political and moral strength from the get-go is if we, as the Australian people, tell the government and tell the parliament it should be treated, they should treat it with the seriousness it deserves. And the only way that happens is if we vote yes in a referendum. It's as simple as that, really, in my mind. Thank you. I'm going, can you pass me that iPad? Because I also want to make sure I'm asking some of your questions too, so I'm not forgetting about the audience. Whilst I look at these audience questions, I'm going to come to you, Lyndon, and ask, do you think constitutional change will advance reconciliation? Um, I don't know. <laughs> so come on, the panel, and don't know. Um, if it doesn't, I think it will have an impact, a negative one. Um, I think from the start, I shared the view that um, if this is how it's going to be, if this is what's going to be on the table, we need to get it done. I think I heard Tony say something along those lines as well, to get it um, to be successful, because if it's not, you know, where to from here? We were talking before this about um, consistently humble asks from Indigenous people, from Bark treaties to ATSIC work, recognition rights and reform from 1995. Um, that's still really relevant today. And it's been along those consistent lines. And so when um, you know people say there's not enough information or that this is new or it's a radical undertaking, that's bullshit. Um, this has been a consistent view. You just cannot argue that we have not been consistent in these requests and they've been respectful and they've been humble um, and they've been torn apart. And like Tony said, we can only keep offering uh, the olive branch um, in the hope that something will turn, that, that this country will recognise um, justice and equity. You know, one of the fundamental uh, principles we lie to ourselves about is, is, you know, is equity. Um, and when you look at the experiences of black people in this country, they are not equitable. Um, you know, the, the idea of a fair go, um, you cannot argue that Indigenous people have had a fair go. So it needs this level of introspection that I think the country's been incapable of to date, and that's been demonstrated. But here's another opportunity um, to have a go at this. Um, it is a moment in time, and I think it's a really important one. Mm. Mm. So I'm going to come to some of the um, questions from the audience, because they're really good and there's been really great engagement. Thank you, everyone who's been asking questions, and thank you for people who've been voting questions up. By far the most popular question, which is sort of the question of the hour, really, is what is the crux of the argument both for and against having the voice to Parliament? Do you want to have a stab at it first, Tony? I will give my view of it. You? Yep. Um, the, the reasons for uh, having a voice to Parliament, from my perspective, uh, really centre upon the ability to change the way government interacts with us. I, I, during my day job, I am involved in native title matters, negotiations with government all, all of the time. And I know, I know from the work that I've done that government is, is created to, to maintain its own existence and its own power. It's not... It's not a, a beast that shares power. It's not designed to share power. And no, no matter where I've worked, 
everybody said, but we want to we want to make the decisions for ourselves. We want to we want to um, be able to look after our country ourselves. And government just can't bring itself to do it. And so we, we where it's most stark for me is in this uh, idea of jointly managed national parks. What happens is that the national parks and wildlife services all around the country refuse to hand over the decision-making power to the traditional owners. And, and the traditional owners end up being on an advisory panel and have no budgetary control and have no, no control over, their, over the national park even though they desperately say, we can manage this better than you. Government cannot on its own do that because it's not designed to do that. But if we've got a voice that can monitor and make comment and hold to account the government and say, you have to learn how to divest power to our communities, then I think we've got a real chance of seeing that happen. Because the, the, the way it's going at the moment, it, it, it can't go on. It, it just can't go on. The rates of uh, the removal of our children uh, are increasing. Notwithstanding the apology. The rates of uh, our uh, people being incarcerated are increasing, notwithstanding the closing the gap process notwithstanding the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody. We, we can't keep going down this path. We've got to get to a position where we're in, in some control. And so I think, for me, the capacity of the voice to be able to t fill that role is critical. Yes, it will have a, have a function in uh, uh, ensuring that the treaty process is, is right, but. You know, it, every Indigenous land use agreement with government which settles a native title claim, the, the native title group has to be armed with lawyers the whole time from that day forward because they've got to, they've got to battle against the government to maintain the rights that they've been able to secure in the agreement. That's the reality of it. And, in, and unless you've got a body in there in government saying, you can't keep doing it this way, you've got to change. You've got to learn how to divest power. I, I, you know, without that, I don't think we're going to see any change because government has, has consistently demonstrated that it cannot make decisions for us which are to our benefit. And, and the, way it, the way it plays out, and I'll finish on this, the way it plays out is that government has to make a whole range of decisions. And usually those with the loudest voice and the squeakiest wheel and the most power and the most connected end up getting their preferred outcome. And I've been in government, Lyndon and I worked in government for six years together. Well, he wasn't there for six with me, but anyway. What happens? is somewhere along that path, the indigenous people's view gets pushed out of the way and everybody else's concerns are, are, uh, make the final decision. And we see it in, in, in the negotiations around amendment of the Native Title Act. We, we have our say, but in the end, it's a negotiation between the government and the mining companies about what the, the Native Title Act looks like. And so it, it, this absence of clout, this absence of political access, I think will in part, it's not going to be a, a panacea, but will in part be remedied by a voice to parliament. So does anyone, I mean, you don't have, <laughs> thank you. Um, thanks, Tony. Does anyone want to give the crux of the no argument? <laughs> um, and because there, there's a second question that also talks about why are some Indigenous Australians against the voice to Parliament? So does anyone at least want to explain some I'll, of that? I'll have a go. Yeah. Um, so one of the arguments I've heard from uh, the no sort of campaign um, is treaty first, and I'm sympathetic to that. We we work on 
treaty in Jambana, um, and it sort of goes, and the reason that I'm sympathetic is it goes to Tony's point of no matter how smart we are, how uh, strategic we are, how well organised, how passionate we are, um, we're disempowered. And I'm just sick of getting beat. Sick of getting beat, not because they're better than us, but because they have more power than us. And so I really get the, the no um, sort of vote from that perspective. And I think it's also important to note that there's sort of two camps, at least to my view, that um, within the no camp, and there's, you know, Indigenous people who have genuine concerns. They, they do not trust this government. They don't trust any government to give full effect to what people are saying. And then there are the racists, you know. I think I heard someone say, um, it's not racist to say no, but all racists will vote no. So. I, yeah, I think I don't like that as well. Yeah, no, I think, I think uh, Tony gave a really strong answer for the, the yes case, of course, and I agree with um, what Lyndon's saying about the maybe more progressive left, uh, uh, progressive no case about treaty first. I, I think uh, on the... Um, the other side of the no case, I'd say, that, you know, at it, taking it at its highest, and I don't agree with it, I think it's wrong, and, but I think it's what Robin was talking about right at the start. Uh, taking it at its highest, the, the other no case would be, does this divide us on the basis of race? And I think it, the answer is clearly no, and I'll explain why in a moment, but I think that is the concern that a lot of people have, because they're, you know, we're very lucky to live in a country where equality is prized, right? We are all equal. That wasn't the case for many, many years, as Robin, Tony and Lyndon can attest, right? This is certainly not the case of what it has been. And so people might be concerned, does this give special rights to one group of Australians? But as Robin was saying right at the start, it's not a racial question. It's a question about peoples. Uh, and it's not a recognition that there are different races or one group has special rights. It's a recognition that there is a group of Australians, the first Australians, first peoples, who have a 65,000 year continuing connection to country here. Uh, and they are not part of our constitution. They're not part of our country at the moment. They are, as um, uh, Tony and Lyndon were saying, essentially it's a, it's a demographic minority of 3% of the population who will routinely lose in democratic debates and democratic votes because of their demographics. And so this is, goes some way to trying to you know, you know, uh, fix up the, that, that process, the, the, the impossibility of a democratic society when you have one group of Australians who are very different for very unique and distinctive reasons who will routinely lose in political battles. The, so that's one part of it. The other part I would say is that there's no, the voice doesn't grant special rights to anyone. The voice, as Tony was saying right at the start, it's an opportunity to speak to parliament and to government, to make representations. We can all do that. I, I made a submission to the parliamentary committee report into this. I made a representation to parliament. You know, we can do this routinely. We all do this at different times. So this is not any special right. This doesn't take away my right to do that. So at its highest, there's a concern about equality, but I think it misunderstands the argument. It's about peoples, and it doesn't take away anyone's rights. Can, can I just add on the no question? From a, from a purely a, 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 a position of trying to analyse the electorate, it's clear that there's, there's probably uh, 15 to 20% who are just straight out no who uh, have a particular view about life in Australia and that any rights we had uh, were, were disappeared when um, the British arrived. And then they're not going to change their view. And then there's 30 or 40% who are undecided. Mm. And what the no campaigns have been doing is, is playing to the fears of those people and putting out as many uh, uh, different arguments as they can to try and hook individuals and, and tap into their fear. And um, we know, we know that in Australia, non-First Nations people have a bias towards First Nations people. There's a, there was a very good study that came out of uh, ANU, um, in 2019 to the effect that three out of four Australians have a negative unconscious or implicit bias against Aboriginal people. And that is a, that is a product of the way in which this country was settled. The, the, 
there, we were subjected to violence and there's a conspiracy of silence about that and we were treated as second class in order to facilitate our dispossession. And that's really deeply embedded in the society and, and many people are able to rationalise that and, and move beyond it and, and uh, act appropriately. But, but what, the, what the hard right is doing is just tapping into those very deep latent fears. And people say, well, I don't know, what, what'll happen? Well, you know, and it's, it's like that uh, movie Wake and Fright where the black fella's standing outside the window. They're all, they're all going, oh, what's happening? When I saw that movie when I was a kid, I went, hey, who's that fella out there? <laughs> <laughs> I felt like I was outside looking in, you know, but... Um, so, uh, that, that's, what's, that's what's going on. That's what's going on, and, and what it's going to take is good people, good people who are able to harness and, and, and logically overcome those irrational fears mm. to speak to those around them and say, look, the, the sky's not going to crump, fall in. They all said that the, 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 you know, the, the world was going to uh, end in Australia when Mar the Mabo decision was handed down. The, the sky's not going to cave in. We, we're finding a place for Aboriginal people in this country and we should all get behind it. And, and hopefully we'll learn something along the way. And, and, it's, and it's all of you who are here, mm. speaking to your friends and your family and, and not allowing the, the misinformation that's purposely designed to trigger fear to grab hold. Thank you. And I'm going to... Oh, well, I'm about to come to you, Robin, but you should add to that point. I just, I just wanted to add that I think... The fact that um, when we listen to the things that have been outlined mm. about, particularly I'm reflecting on Tony's comments about government's inability to accommodate our voice in a really, our, our ways of seeing the world and to really hear and honour that, that there is always that, yeah, you'll be right, oh, thank you, thank you for that, we'll just keep, we'll just do it our way, thanks for that. I think that where we, uh, where our um, colleagues, our brothers and sisters are sceptical, not trusting, I think that the, the community just needs to be able to hold that space with us and know that this is, this is a proposition. We don't know exactly what it's going to look like and many of us will be standing there going, we don't believe you, we don't trust you. So I think it's okay, and that is, our, that is our right, and that is okay for people to hold, for, for everyone. Well, I'm not, it's not okay for what I feel is, you know, like a, this position that Tony's just described too, of, the, of, the, of the, um, this racist position that is largely mobilised for power and, you know, is in, in some ways, I think, just a way to step forward into power on our backs, as is not uncommon. But where we are worried and um, holding, you know, some scepticism, I think the rest of the community just has to say that's okay, and I'm going to make up my own mind, and I will know that some of our, some of my, you know, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander brothers and sisters are worried. So let's be the complex society that we are, and just be okay with holding that, the different views. Thanks. Which is related to a question, again, a, another um, very popular question within the audience, um, which I was also going to put to you, which is young LGBTIQ plus people were impacted by the same-sex marriage debate. How do we protect Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children during the referendum debate? And the reason I was going to go to you on that was because that's something we've also been talking about at the university, about cultural load and about just creating a safe space um, so that, that it doesn't... Well, I'm sure Tony can already tell us about the nasty social media environment, but that it doesn't just really have an unfair and horrific toll on people. I think the truth is it just will. My... I got to... My dear cousin is in the is is joining us today. She had an invitation to go to lunch. With I hope you, can I tell this story with a an emailed list of questions that her um, that the host would like to ask her about, including her family's view on the on the voice, her view on the voice, what other Aboriginal people like this list of questions as part of a lunch invitation. <laughs> 
I can, and you know, this, that's not the question about children, but it is impacting on us. And it, I think one of the, you know, the, we need to be good allies, watch out for our people, don't stand by while someone just drills someone with questions <laughs> and they don't want to answer them. You know, we don't always, you know, we might want to talk about how we're going today, not necessarily what our view on the voice is or what our family's view on the voice is. And maybe we will, but we'll make that clear. You know, we'll tell you if we want to talk about it. You know, we won't be backward and coming forward if we want to talk about it. But not everybody wants to talk about it. Not everybody wants to talk about it all the time. Our kids don't necessarily know what, you know, the answers are. And, um, and we need to be mindful of that and careful about that. Um, you know, I was... Yeah, I was talking to I was I was at lunch yesterday with two um, women who've since married, and they said it was just hellish for us. We'd walk into the local golf club, and they go, "Here's our lesbians, here's our lesbian friends." You know, are you getting married? And just this kind of constant scrutiny. So I think um, while it's really important for us all to talk about this, to educate ourselves, to uh, watch, you know, watch what's going on. We also do need to be, you know, mindful and careful of each other in this in this time, and watch out for our young ones who who will be perhaps ask things that you know they're just not in a position to to answer. Thanks. Does anyone else want to talk about that? Um, I'll just at a personal level, um, it's very different for all of us who are in this space where we are constantly asked to speak. I I was a, I'm a director on the Aboriginal Legal Service in New South Wales. I was at a board meeting Thursday and Friday. We passed a resolution and had a lengthy discussion about support of the voice. Um, we passed a, a resolution in support of the voice at the, at the board meeting. On Saturday, I spoke via Zoom at, a, at a, um, an event in Darwin on the voice, and I'm here today. Um, and the, re the next few months looks pretty much the same. So, you know, there's a big, big toll on all of us. But, um, you know, it's something that has to be done and, uh, I, and you know, I'm up for it and um, I'll continue to do it. But us here in the city, um, we, we only see a, a muted form of, the, uh, of what's going on. I ha my people are all in Queensland and, and people I know in country Queensland uh, are being abused in public places by rednecks in a way that hasn't happened in the past. And what, it, what I think it says uh, to me is that we've got a fair way to go yet and it's going gonna, it's gonna to get uglier before it gets better and to the extent that uh, we have uh, allies, those allies need to uh, stand up at the appropriate times. Uh, you know... So if, if, um, if you see that sort of behaviour, um, be brave. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah I might just, <laughs> might just add to that. We um, recently did a truth-telling um, project with the Ebony Institute, um, interviewed a number of people about that, and, and the idea of uh, care um, was consistent in that when you're asking... Indigenous people to stand up, brush themselves off, tell their story for the twentieth time. You know there there has to be some payoff to that, and at the same time, people are doing that. Um, yeah, to to care for each other, uh, because yeah, I've had the conversations with other other black people, and they're just tired of the voice. They don't want to talk about it anymore, and, and it's a difficult one because I think you know, I think we need disruption, and the voice is doing that in, in a number of ways. Um, we need a disruption to the system, uh, which Tony sort of articulated is incredibly difficult um, to fix and to manoeuvre in for us, but um, there's a price that comes with that and it is often exhausting um, doing that. Anything? Yeah, I'll just add two things. I agree with everything that's been said. The, the first one is that the same-sex marriage um, postal survey was not legally necessary. And we didn't need to do that. Uh, we do need to vote you know, for the referendum to make the change. So it's not something that you know, people want to do, obviously, in government, that they, they have to do if we, if we want to get this up. Uh, so it is going to be really difficult, and I s totally uh, agree with everyone saying that we need the well, Aboriginal people need the support of allies to help in this states. So you know, educate yourself and take on the boat burden yourself a little bit. Share that. Um, the other point I just want to make, and I think Lyndon mentioned this right at the start, um, 
you know, the psychological distress that Tony's talking about, that he knows his uh, family and friends are experiencing in different parts of the country, I would say that would be magnified if the vote goes down. Um, and a nationwide vote that goes down, I, I think, will be devastating uh, for many, many people. Not, you know, people say that Australia will, will feel shame in the international affairs. I don't really care about that, to be frank. I think about what it will feel at an individual and community level, psychologically. So for that reason alone, I, I think you, you have to vote yes. It, that's an interesting point, because then one of the other questions is... So basically, I'm reading the questions in version of the uh, votes. That's my democratic way of choosing which question to use. But the one that's got the next best number of votes was, what happens if the referendum doesn't get up? And the question goes on to say, do we continue into treaty and truth, and does that change our approach? Does Who wants to take a stab at what happens if the referendum doesn't get up? I just have a quick, quick answer to that. We do what we do when we're disappointed, what we always do when we're disappointed, we keep going. And we don't stop the work that we're doing and uh, all the initiatives, all the, you know, all the services, all the, all the work that we do in this university, all the work that you might be doing, we don't miss a beat, we keep going. And that, that is what we'll do. And that's not to say, and I'm sure others will talk about the hit that the nation will take and the hit that we will take. But really importantly, I think we have to remember that you know, our children will still need us, our people in custody will still need us, and they will still need you and whatever you're doing to support that. So whatever happens, we need to pick ourselves up as we always do and keep going, um, no matter what happens. I know that might sound harsh and it, it won't. It's not speaking to the impact and I know others will speak to the impact, but I do think it's really important that we, we keep going and that we keep going with the truth telling and the treaty making and the services and the looking after people that we don't miss much too much of a beat if that's what happens. Uh, just following on from that point, you only have to look at the, how uh, staunch and proud and strong the, uh, our brothers and sisters in the Northern Territory are, um, even after... 13 years of 15 years of the intervention. Um, they, they're not laying down. Uh, at, a, at a political level, uh, it's, I, I have very grave fears that if the referendum goes down, even though the Labor Party election policy was for the establishment of a Makarata Commission for, for truth telling and, and treaties, that 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 will still be established, but uh, the Liberal Party, the coalition, when it gets back into power, so if, I, I can't see them getting back into power at the next election, no, no matter which way the referendum goes. I think that they don't have the capacity because of their stance to take back the seats from the Teals that they lost at the last election. And, and so that they're, they've um, committed themselves to, to a path which sees them losing the next general election. But the one after that, they might win. And so at that stage, a Makarata Commission might be three or four years old. It might have some arrangements in place with the state, state mm. treaty processes. On past form, I would expect that the, the coalition will come into government and will say the nation has voted against self-determination for Aboriginal people and we are abolishing the treaty process. The, 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 the referendum spoke and we will ab abide by the people's wishes. And if it's not, if, if it's not uh, so embedded that it can't be unravelled, mm -hmm. by the time they get back into government, I, I expect that that's what they're going to do. And I, I'm really fearful of that. Uh, because, like Lyndon, um, even though the voice is an, a very important structural element, the way in which my people secure our future is through some set of uh, agreed rules about how we all operate out on my country. And that's the treaty process. That's interesting. So you're really saying that to... the. the at the hub of the question is, do we then proceed with treaty and truth? And you're saying it actually puts treaty and truth at risk. It does. It, it does. Absolutely puts the long-term 
uh, uh, viability, political viability of treaty and truth at risk. I, I have every belief that the that the federal government will proceed with the Makarata Commission. Mm -hmm. uh, whether they commence that before the referendum or after the referendum, I don't know. But but there's money in the budget for it. It's part of their election platform. I'm I'm certain that they will do it. But the problem will be how how a no vote will be used by future coalition governments, and it's a very real very real issue. The, the, if we think about the the vehemence with which they've approached this, their response to this referendum, we know that that they are, will do uh, all sorts of things in order to uh, avoid having to be answerable to Aboriginal people. And can I, I just, Robin, I just jump in too. before before Lyndon? I think um, my observation, and I could be wrong, but my observation is that, as I said before we are a really good platform to, for them to jump on to get back into political relevance, to harness the hatred and the fear that's out there for their own purposes. Ideologically aligned or not, I don't know whether they actually believe it, but we know it works for them to harness the people who are frightened of us and who think they have something to lose. So that, I don't think we can ever underestimate that. Whether they believe it or not, it's a power play. Mm. So that's really um, has... Um, consequences forever, really. Mm. Lyndon? I was just going to say quickly that um, I think as black people we need to try to find value in the process, regardless of the outcome. So, you know, we've been disappointed many, many times um, along these and other lines, but um, so one of the key things for me and what I was talking about before was how we as black people, as black nations, talk and negotiate with each other and the voice is something that um, there's disagreement about. People are pretty much agree with everything. You know, my views are very consistent with they, they're saying no, and I think that can be a really valuable thing about how we respect each other during that process, and it's good practice for me uh, for treaty, really, um, because that's where we, we want to get to. And so with all these processes that are going on, if we find that value in the process and the outcome will be what it will be and I, I agree with Robin that it's, you know, it'll be business as usual, we'll, we'll get back to doing the things that we do, still working towards treaty and other things but um, there, there's an opportunity in the process so that we're not just sort of left, um, you know, at the whim of the, the majority of people for a decision on the referendum. Yeah. Amy? Uh, yeah, just to add one extra thing, I agree with that as well. Um, one thing I think people aren't really aware of is that every government in Australia except Western Australia has committed to a treaty process. Mm. So every single state and territory and Commonwealth government except for WA has committed to a treaty process. Um, my fear, draw, drawing on from what Tony was saying, is that because it's going to be a state-wide vote, there'll be some governments who, where a no vote might succeed and the impetus for treaty in those states will dissipate immediately because the government will say, well, there's no votes in this and we need votes to get into power next time. Mm. Uh, and so even if the federal government is still committed, uh, and even if things continue for a little bit longer at that stage, and, and they will have a lot of momentum in themselves and, and driving the process, I think the momentum and the energy it's in certain places around the country will fall apart. Mm. Mm. So we're nearing time, but there's a last question. There's another question from the audience, which is similar to one that I want to ask. Um, and this really is about, you know, the nature of all of Australia voting in a constitutional referendum when, as we've already described, a lot of people don't even know what the constitution is and whether or not we've got the right to bear arms, as Harry um, said before. So the question from the audience is, how can we better cut through the complexities of this such that the average Australian can understand and make an educated vote in the referendum? Who wants to have a go at that first? All go right, Robin. I'll go first. One of the things I've said to people is, wouldn't you like a parliament and an executive that has the best advice possible when they're making laws and policies for this country, wouldn't you like to have something that, you know, somebody that gives them the, the absolute best advice possible from the people on the ground, from the people at community level to the people who are our doctors, lawyers, architects, social policy people, all the people that we have who can give really expert advice, wouldn't you like that? Wouldn't that be a better way to do business in government? 
The thing I, I do say also that is um, sometimes maybe complex for people is that we do have a human right. It is a human right of all peoples of effective participation in matters that affect us. It's just the implementation of a human right. Thank you. Yeah. Tony. Um, I think for the majority of the public, it's too complicated. And what that means is that they will look to the people that they rely upon to guide them. And um, there, there are vocal people on social media who, who put forward different positions, some of them informed and a lot of them uninformed. But um, it, what will be really important is, is how the Liberal backbenchers um, uh, deal with their ability to vote whichever way they want. Mm. So the, the Liberal Party n n no mandate is, uh, is only binding on the Cabinet. Uh, there are all of those uh, backbenchers, including now Julian Lisa in the, in the electorate of Barara, mm. um, who can vote whichever way they want. And it's those people in the cities who are going to lead their community. And if, if Julian, but if Julian Lee is saying we should support this, well, that'll be very important in terms of the the, the votes. In the northern beaches uh, where I live, we've got um, we've got uh, Zali Stegel and Sophie Sconce. They're both supporting the voice. The northern beaches council, which covers the whole. Uh, of the Northern Beaches has a population of 250,000 people. The population of the Northern Territory is 250,000. Mm. So the, the battle for, uh, for the majority of states and the overall majority will be won and lost in the, in the urban centres, in my view. And so that's why it's important that all of you all of us speak to the people we know and we we it, it's something that will be won and lost on a ground game um, and uh, and so um, you know I, I think it can be won but there's a long way to go yet that's a really interesting point Tony I was thinking it myself I live in Glebe on Gadigal land as I said before I live in the, one of the safest federal Labor seats in the country, and normally it really doesn't matter what I do in election time, um, the vote's obvious. But actually, it's a totally different dynamic because every vote that you bring out, even if you are in these totally blue ribbon, safe Liberal or Labor seats, actually will count to the overall majority. And that's quite different to in a normal electoral context and something that's worth remembering. Lyndon. Yeah, um, I don't want to end on a cynical <laughs> note, but I think there's a lot of people out there um, looking for a palatable reason to vote no. Um, it's been sort of demonstrated, I think, with previous referenda, um, and, and certainly a, a progressive issue like this um, is a really hard one to, to get over. Um, I remember many years ago, um, I was speaking to a woman who was involved in the no case for the Republic, and um, the takeaway message from her was running a no case on a referendum in Australia is money for jam. She said, it's the easiest job I ever had. And so that, without being too cynical about it, um, it is a difficult thing to do. And like Tony said, the, the way on that is, you know, the full court press, talking to people, getting organisations, industries, sectors, sports. Um, it's a full court press to overcome that because it really is difficult. Harry? Yeah, I agree with that. Again, it's sort of, if you have limited knowledge about what is in the Constitution, let alone what it means and what it is, it's much easier to say, well, I don't know, I'm just going to vote no. Uh, so a compulsory election, a compulsory referendum vote, and it is compulsory, we're all going to have to vote, does make the easier for the no case. And the history in Australia says that there have been eight successful referendums and of, out of 44 attempts. So uh, it is hard. There's only, Labor Party has put up 25 referendums and it's got one out of the 25. Uh, so it is very difficult to win a referendum. Um, and so we do need people to educate themselves, to find out information, and I think the, and then talk to friends and family and people you might not talk to about these things more generally. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm sort of been doing a lot of these talks recently. I gave one to my hockey club the other day, right? Just because I think, well, these people I play hockey with, I don't know anything about them, but I see them every week. I should tell them about this stuff and they'll tell their friends. So it's little bits like that. And I think, um, I know a lot of people say, oh, I want more detail. There is detail out there, but I do think, as Robin said, it's important to stick to the principle. This is just a, a question about whether we think Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples should have a say over the laws and policies that affect them. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's pretty straightforward. So we've got three minutes left. I'm just going to go back up the line, starting with you, Harry. Um, and really, you can say whatever you want to say at the end of the um, moment. Tell your truth to the audience. Um, but if you do have some good recommendations for materials people could pursue to get to know things more or how to sign up if they're interested in volunteering, whatever, could you provide that information too? And before we close, I'll also say that um, Koori Connections are here with us in the Student Learning hub in, hub in Building 2. And you can drop in and have a chat and ask any questions about the upcoming Voice to Parliament, how to be a voice for reconciliation, or if you want to learn more about local Indigenous culture. So that's Koori Connections, and you can continue the conversation after this event in Building 2 in the Student Hub. Starting with you, Harry. Uh, yeah, there's a lot out there. And I think, uh, I know the Uluru Dialogues team, which is based out of UNSW, they have a yarning session every week. And it's open to every single person in Australia. The Zoom link is available. You type in Uluru Dialogues yarning session. And uh, you've got people like Megan Davis and Pat Anderson who will talk to you about what the voice means and how it will work. Uh, so that's a pretty, pretty easy and pretty useful way to get some information about it. There's also lots of um, uh, university websites that do things like this. I know UTS are doing things. We're putting a video together. Uh, the ANU First Nations portfolio has, a, uh, I think, 11 or 12 questions, responses to common concerns about the voice. And so this, I think, is particularly useful to talk to people who might be generally interested in it but not really know anything about it. And it's questions like, well, and, and answers to uh, questions like, why do we need a voice if there are 11 Indigenous peoples in Parliament already? Um, why do we need a voice if, if Indigenous peoples uh, can already speak to government in different ways? Questions like this. Uh, will this be special rights to one group of people? Uh, and the answers are pretty straightforward. They're just about a paragraph and a half. Uh, they give you really helpful information if you want to talk to friends and family about this. Um, I'll just steal Robin's of um, holding the space and what I said before about um, respectful uh, conversations, particularly between uh, black people uh, and learning sort of how to disagree with each other on, on some things, but moving forward on so much other work that's left to be done, that would be mine. Um, in terms of um, material that I think is essential reading, I direct you again to the voice design principles. You can get those off of the um, Uluru Dialogue website or the voice website that NIAA has. Um, read them because they answer most of the questions about the structural, the detail, and when people throw up uh, you know, issues about lack of representation or or the various challenges people uh, say uh, about the model or the absence of a model are, are answered in that document. Um, you know, um, I, I don't know what else to say. Um, watch Charlie's Country. Uh, I, I watched that movie the other day. Uh, Gopal, awesome movie speaks to many of the things that we're talking about here. Thank you. Yeah, I don't, it's, final words are a bit hard. I think, um, yes, we need to really stay kind to each other, hold this space so that we don't necessarily all see things the same way. For me, I think there are many, this does come, it's one if in many ways that we have tried try to and have held a conversation with the nation, with, with the um, Commonwealth government, the state governments. This is one of the things in the long road and it won't be the last. And I just think we might as well give it a run. You know, we might as well give it the best run we can because maybe it'll, you know, it's just one in this step towards Makarata, towards truth telling. So. Might as well give it a run, but we need to be really kind and patient and considerate of all the views that we have. Thank you. And thank you to my panel. I think um, my panel, the panel.
I think you can hear from the applause and a couple of people standing in the audience. That was a really magnificent panel. Thank you so much for giving your time today. I found it absolutely illuminating for me in so many ways, so thank you. Um, the most important thing from my point of view, I think, is that people vote. You know, this is a democratic right to be, have a say in your country, in the future you want for your country, a recognition of the past. For students that are watching us, make sure you're enrolled to vote and you're enrolled to vote at the right address. So get onto the AEC website as soon as you can and make sure your actual enrolment is up to date. It is a compulsory vote, but you should also be seizing that, that the right to have a say in the future of your country and seizing this historical moment. So vote. Um, stay connected, keep finding out more and more. The more you learn about your country and your history, uh, the more important it is for the way forward. So thank you everyone for joining us today and thank you again to our really fantastic panel.